This is the Prestigious Initiative. Welcome. I'm Chris Beam. Here with me, we have Mr. Jim Marshall. Jim Marshall is the discoverer of Septemics. And Jim, I'll, let you, I'll turn it over to you. I'll let you introduce yourself, and then we'll get right into our scales for today. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, as Chris said, I uh, discovered this hitherto unknown natural phenomenon, uh, which greatly hate in the understanding of people, from which I created a revolutionary practical philosophic system and published it in the book, Hierarchies, pardon me, Septemics, Hierarchies of Human Phenomena. And today we're going to discuss some of the content of that book. Very good. Let me pull up the slide here. All right. Okay. This is extremely important. Uh, the scope of this is vast. Uh, there is nobody on earth to whom this is not an important scale. Uh, this is a linear scale, meaning there is no apparent congruence between levels one and seven. It's a gradual scale, meaning there's an infinitude of gradations between the levels. And it's a general scale, meaning once you find somebody on this scale, you're done. Now, it is conceivable that a person could be assessed on this scale in two different areas of his life. In other words, he might have two careers going, something like that. Uh, but, but still, even within that, it's still a general scale. Once you find the level, you're done. And then it's just moving up. Uh, also, this scale is unusual in that it aligns with another scale, which is uh, extremely beneficial. Uh, because this is one of several scales in which there is an individual scale that also manifests as a group scale and the two dovetail, although in a way that uh, is not obvious and I had to figure out how they aligned and I'll explain that as we go. So, <clears throat> everybody enters the scale at level seven, meaning, Everyone begins in any area as an ignoramus uh, and in, in a uh, monosyllabic way, I would say a fool. That's what an ignoramus is. It's a fool. a fool. An ignoramus is somebody who doesn't know that he doesn't know. He doesn't even know that he doesn't know. Uh, so you, let's say you have a three-year-old kid. He doesn't know anything at all about football. So he sees a football, he says, what's that thing? And dad says, well, it's a football. What's a football? That's an ignoramus. You, you know, you, he's not at the point where you can really do anything with him. Now, all you can do with an ignoramus is interact with him. The dad can say, well, this is a type of a ball that's used in a game that men play. Oh, I see. How do you do it? Well, you sometimes you can run while you're carrying it, and sometimes you can throw it to people. I see. So in other words, you're, you can't really promote to him. He doesn't know enough. Uh, now, if you look at this with an adult, let's say you have somebody who's never heard of jujitsu, has no idea what it means. Hey, he walks down the street, and there's a sign in front of a store that says jujitsu. So he goes in and says, what is this, some kind of sushi? Guy says, no, this is a, a, a martial art. Oh, what's that? Well, you see, this is a type of discipline where you learn how to defend yourself in a very specific way. It's an ancient art. Oh, really? I never heard of this before. See, this guy's an ignoramus. He doesn't know anything about you. So you can't promote him. You can't sign him up for a course. He's not interested in a course because he doesn't know what you do. That's what an ignoramus is. So all you can do is interact with him in a general way. Uh, well, what brought you in? Well, I was walking down the street and I saw this sign and I, I thought maybe you guys sold sushi because it sounds Japanese to me. And I like sushi. Oh, okay. See, you're just interacting with him. You're not trying to promote to him. He's not up to that. Now, above that, you get the layman. This is what we would think of as the normal person. 
The layman is a consumer. He's not your best consumer, but he is a consumer. You can promote to a layman. So your average guy knows what jujitsu is. So you can say, well, here's my business card. If you ever decide you want to uh, develop some ability to defend yourself, come down and we'll, you can take a course. Okay, so you're promoting to him. You can promote to a layman, uh, which is more than can be said for an ignoramus. And when you talk to an ignoramus, you get this deer in the headlights look. They have no idea wh what you are, what you're doing, you know, what this is. Uh, and you can imagine, because septemics is an entirely new subject, I've been into this all the time. People have no idea what it is. They can't pronounce it. They never heard of it. What is this thing? So then I have to go through that whole process of interacting with them. They're not even up to being promoted to. But then when a person learns what it is, oh, I see what this is. You have this philosophy. It's in a book. You can buy the book. Yeah. Would you like to buy the book? It's available in this. Thing. You know, see, you can promote. Above that, you have an amateur. An amateur is a dilettante. Now, this is a person who's doing something, uh, but it's not good enough to get paid for. So this is, you know, if, for example, to continue this analogy, the guy, he takes some courses in jujitsu, you know, he gets maybe a yellow belt. Uh, and, you know, he knows a little bit about it. Now, this is somebody, you can sell him something. You can sell him the attire that he wears in the course. You can sell him a bunch of future courses. Well, yes, we'll sell you 50 uh, classes in, in a block form, which is discounted. You see, this is your best customer. So for example, if you go to a baseball game, uh, you will find out that most of the people, uh, most of the men, excuse me, most of the men who were watching that game were baseball players. They played Little League, they played high school ball, American Legion ball, college ball. They're not professionals, they're amateurs. But these are the people who will spend $100 for a ticket to go see their favorite team. So, uh, yes, the layman is a consumer, but he's at the bottom end of consumer. The amateur is the guy he spends $200 to buy a Derek Jeter jacket that has number two on the back. You know, so that's, those are really your best customers. That's, those are the people who keep you in business. The layman is sort of somebody you're bringing in at the bottom end of your business. The amateur is the backbone of your business. So, for example, let's say you, you have a record store. The actual musicians, Spend a lot of money buying music, whether it's CDs or downloads or whatever it is, you know, because they're amateur musicians. They know a lot more than the layman. Uh, so you sell him something. Now, these ways of handling the person correspond to the organizational level, which is in another scale. So this tells you. If you have a business, or even beyond a business, any organization, how to handle the person. So if the person is at one level, you do one thing. If he's at another level, you do a different thing. And if you do the wrong thing, you get a bad effect, which is the whole point of Septemex. It's There's a level. When you get the level, you know what to do. And if you don't have the level, lots of luck which is what, why you see something like 90% of new businesses fail. They don't have the skill. Now, the next level up is a person who's competent. A person who's competent is a professional or can be a professional. So this is a guy, he was an amateur. Let's say he's an amateur keyboard player. Eventually, he gets so good at it, he can be a professional. Somebody will hear him play and say, you know, you're really good. Would you like a job in my band? Yes. Gives him a job in his band, and now the guy's making money. So what do you do with a person who's competent? Level four. 
you get him to produce. So he shows up at the gig, he plays, the people applaud, he gets his money, he goes home. See, that's production. The club owner's happy, the band leader's happy, the audience is happy. There's production there. You don't really get production out of an amateur. An amateur is, he doesn't know enough to really be productive. You know, oh, well, I can play Stairway to Heaven. Oh, that's nice. Well, how about this? Oh, I don't know that song. Whereas a professional will say, yeah, just play it for me. In three minutes, he has it. So the next level up is the expert. The expert is a master of whatever this thing is. He's beyond a mere professional. It is a mistake to try to get the expert to produce. He's beyond that. He's, he doesn't want to do that. What you do with him is you get him to refine the product. So let's say you are manufacturing cars and you have a guy who's working on your assembly line. He's been there for five years and he's the guy that all the other people go to when they have questions. Well, what about this? How do I fix this? And what do I do with that? And where do I find this? And he's the guy, he's the answer man for all the. This is the guy, after a while, he is so expert at this, that he can be in a supervisory capacity. You take him off the line, so you're stopping him from producing cars, but you're getting him to refine the product. He's the guy who just pays attention and says, you know, there's a better way to do this. We can save 10 minutes in production of this car if we do this instead of that. And he tells the boss, and they refine the sequence in which they assemble the car. Well, that's what an expert is good at. The expert is the guy you want running your operation. You want him to manage the store or the factory or the business, whatever it is. Uh, if you had try to get a professional to do that, it doesn't work. He can produce, but he's not an expert. So all kinds of things are going to come up that are beyond his purview. He doesn't have all the answers. He just knows how to do it. So, for example, uh, let's say you have a guy who works in a shoe factory, right? He's working with the machines, manufacturing shoes. He does this well. But he's not competent to tell everybody there what to do. He just knows how to make the shoes. He's not an expert. Now we go up to level two, the virtuoso. Now, virtuoso is a word that's generally used in an artistic context. For example, uh, one might say Eddie Van Halen was a virtuoso guitarist. He unquestionably was. Well, that's the, wor the word virtuoso's natural home is in artistry. You could be, you might say Monet was a virtuoso painter. But this is not only in artistic areas. It's in any area. This is a person who's beyond being an expert. This guy is so good at what he does that it takes on an artistic capacity. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, my father's father was a restaurateur. He owned several restaurants. He was the chief, the chief chef in those restaurants. He was a master chef. I have watched him cook. It was like watching Picasso paint. It was like watching pa Pavarotti sing. It was like watching Jimi Hendrix play the guitar. It's like, wow. Now, this was long ago before you had uh, chefs going on TV entertaining people. That didn't even exist back then. So... He, uh, it was more fun to watch him prepare the meal than to eat it. And the food was exquisite. It was perfect. Okay. He knew every tiny little detail, you know, of exactly what wine should go with it and where to put it on the plate and everything else. So that was, I was able to see in my youth. Wow, this is artistic. So it could be anything. Uh, you could see, if you watch 
like a great uh, baseball player. You know, like if you watch Joe DiMaggio catch a fly ball in center field in Yankee Stadium, which you can do on video, it was artistic. He was so good at what he did. He never had a dive. He could run so fast. His hands were so good. It was just like a deer playing in a meadow. You know, it was artistic. That's how good it was. So that's what a virtuoso is. What do you do with a virtuoso? You market him. You don't want to have him refining the product. This guy is so good. You can get money from putting him out there one way or another. Like, what do you do with Eddie Van Helen? You get three guys backing him up who are good enough to play with him. And you send the band out on tour. And then you put him in the studio and, you know, you let him do his thing. And he's got somebody to play the drums, somebody to play the bass part, somebody to sing the lead. And he's the star. He does everything else. It was the same thing in Led Zeppelin. Jimmy Page was really Led Zeppelin. He selected those three players. Part of his genius was selecting those three players. He produced the albums. So Led Zeppelin was really a manifestation of Jimmy Page. He was a virtuoso. And he was smart enough, and his manager, Peter Grant, was smart enough to say, this guy's got it. Let's just put together whatever he wants and put him out. And uh, they were so popular, they were playing stadiums in a time when that was almost unheard of. They would fill the stadium, so then they would put on another date, and they would fill the stadium the second day. So that's what you do. You market this guy. Don't stick him in an office job refining the product. You can make a lot of money from this guy. Could Pavarotti have taught voice? I'm sure he could have. But they made a lot more money letting him go out in front of the public and sing. And people say, wow. So that's how you handle a virtuoso. See, if you take a virtuoso and try to put him in uh, the position where an expert belongs, he will not be happy. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to go out and show the world what he can do. So like the guy who discovered Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix was... was your quotidian musician bouncing around in Greenwich Village playing gigs as a sideman. And somebody whose name eludes me at the moment discovered him and said, this guy's got it. He brought him to England. He got him an English drummer, an English bass player, and the rest is history. That's what you do with a virtuoso. Now, above that is a genius. A genius is unique. For example, there's nobody like Shakespeare. There are many great playwrights, but there's, Shakespeare is in a class by himself, okay? Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth is unique. Most people don't even know he was the best left-handed pitcher in the American League. They don't even know that. They just know him as a hitter. So the genius is unique. He goes beyond mere virtuosity. Einstein, Einstein is unique. He has no peers. There are many great physicists. Many of them were his friends and, and associates. But he's in a class by himself. So what do you do with the genius? You establish an organization around him. So, for example, we have the word Shakespearean, Shakespearean theater, Shakespearean festival. You see, that's establishing an organization around a genius. Or Einstein, we talk about Einsteinian physics. He revolutionized the whole world of physical science. And so his name was on the lips of every physical scientist in the world. So in a sense, there is an organization built around him. So that is how you handle a genius. You don't take a genius and put him out on the road like you would with with uh, Eddie Van Halen. Uh, 
a genius, you have to establish an organization. Now, you could argue, well, wasn't Van Halen uh, an organization established around Eddie Van Halen? And historically, that's not really true, but I think you could argue that anyway. I think Led Zeppelin was an organization created by and around Jimmy Page. So I think you could say they were geniuses. Uh, so that is what you look for to spot a genius. He's unique. There's nobody like him. Perfect example. Jeff Beck. Nobody can play like Jeff Beck. Okay? All the great guitarists in the world were in awe of Jeff Beck. He did something completely different. If you listen to Jeff Beck's latter work, it's like, this is a guitarist? Wait, this guy doesn't even sing? You know, it's like, it was uh, unique. So I think you could argue that Jeff Beck was a genius. And I think a lot of people in the music world already know that. So you could say that in the last 20, 20 years of his life, you know, it was became sort of an institution. Now, the name is still said Jeff Beck on the marquee. And whatever musicians went with him were the best players in the business uh, because they all wanted to play with him. So that's what you do with the genius. So we have how many baseball leagues are named the Babe Ruth League? We have the word Ruthian. That was a Ruthian home run, right? When your name becomes an adjective, it usually means you're a genius. So those are the seven levels. And you, you have to spot the person at the correct level, and then you have to put him into the right slot. So, for example, I had times when uh, I was hiring people, and I could see that the person was overqualified for this job. And I once said to a guy, you have such tremendous ability and skills. Why would you want this job? He had no answer for that, and I never spoke to him again. He just went away. He saw I was right. I could see th that he was too good for the job I wanted to put him in. So people say, well, that wasn't smart. Well, why would you get rid of a guy who was that much better? Because he's not going to fit in. So... Jimi Hendrix, for example, was much better suited to being the star of the Jimi Hendrix experience than to being a sideman, which is what he was doing before he was discovered. So uh, this explains a lot about how to handle people, finding the person at the right level. Now, if you spot yourself correctly, You'll have a realization, and then you can move yourself up to the next level, which is true for every scale. Any questions so far? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. No questions. Very okay. good. Okay. Okay. So now it says this scale aligns with the scale of management. So if you go to group septemics, which is called book two, is book one, individual group two, group uh, scales are in this book two you will see that the scale of management is about organization. That's what management is. Managing and organizing are synonymous. Now you can see that the scale of management intersects, interlocks like a Chinese puzzle with the scale of human ability, but it runs in the opposite direction. It goes seven, six, five, four, three, two, and it's out of sequence. One. Now, this is not obvious at all. This took some real work to, to see this and parse this and put this together. Uh, so uh, we're not on the scale of organization. But, for example, uh, in this 
scale of management, level seven is marketing. That's the last thing you do when you have an organization. Well, who are you going to market? The virtuoso. You see? It locks right in. Prior to marketing, you have refinement. When you, when you have management, you have quality control. That's level six. So that's the expert. See? This fits perfectly. Now, why is one at the top and then it runs one and then you go to the bottom and go up to two? Well, it's just the way it is. And the organizational level, well, when you level one in management is the founder, the person who establishes. So, like in Tesla, it would be uh, the office of Elon Musk. That's level one in the management team. See? And then two, the next thing you have to do is interact with people. So then you're dealing with, you can deal with anybody, you see, because it goes from one and it jumps down to two at the bottom. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but they do interlock. The interlock, and it's extremely useful to anyone who has any kind of an organization to know this because you spot the person and you put him where he belongs. For example, the idea that your best clients are, your, are amateurs, most people don't know that. Most people are focused on selling to the layman. An amateur will spend 10 or 100 times as much as a layman on whatever it is you're selling, whatever it is you're producing, and, and whatever service or product you have. The amateur, so one amateur is worth maybe 10 or 20 or 30 laymen. So a layman will go into a store, right, and buy a guitar for $500. An amateur will say, you mean this is actually Jimi Hendrix's own guitar? Here's $10,000. See, you just made a lot of money because this guy knows what he's talking about. The layman, he doesn't, he doesn't have enough of an understanding. He might not even know who Jimi Hendrix is. Uh, if you talk to a lot of young people today, they don't even know who these people are. Uh, they never heard of uh, Chuck Berry. Who's Chuck Berry? Well, the amateur, see, he knows. You mean this is Chuck Berry's guitar? You want $12,000 for it? Sold. See? He made a lot of money from that guy because he knows what he's talking about. So this is extremely useful. If you have any type of a business or organization, even a charitable organization, this is what you need in order to run it competently. Any questions? No, very good and, and very clear. And obviously, well thought out and, and immediately helpful. Uh, if 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 one could get this, get hands on this, and, and apply this, very good. All right. Next. All right. Scale of memory. Scale of memory. Okay. Okay. This is uh, really fundamental in understanding any human being. Uh, memory is most of what we are. For example, George Washington. All George Washington is, is a memory. You have this idea in your mind that there was this guy from Virginia who led this revolution. That's just in your mind. It's a memory. But you see how big that is, how important that is? I mean, he, Washington is one of the persons on whom I base my life. He, he wrote a book about how you should behave, which I read. I mean, I, when I look at what should I do here, I say, oh, how would Washington have handled this? Well, we know that because we have hundreds of letters and things like that, all kinds of information from multiple sources about him. So it's clear, see? So, well, you can't find him. He's just a memory. Now, you can see the name printed in a book. But 
the author of that book had a memory. Where did he get that memory? Well, he got that memory from a book he read when he was a kid or from a video he watched. So memory is really important. It's a big thing. It's not a minor issue. Now, what are we measuring here? We're measuring truth and falsity. So when memory is high on the scale, it's a truthful memory. And when it's low on the scale, it's a false memory. So again, this is something that a lot of people don't understand. Above level one is absolute truth. It's above level one because absolutes are unattainable. Below level seven is absolute falsity. Okay, it's an unattainable absolute. So a person can get to maybe 99.999% of the truth because he's human, that's as close as he's gonna get. So that is what this scale is, me is measuring. So when we parse memory, we parse it according to truth and falsity. So you say to a guy, uh, the person who freed the slaves was a Republican. He says, oh no, he was a Democrat. This guy has a false memory. He thinks Lincoln was a Democrat. The Democrats hated Lincoln. The Democrats started the Civil War because Lincoln was elected. So that is totally false. So you see this all the time with people. People have uh, ideas that are false. So like, if you spoke to Hitler, he could explain to you for hours and hours, which he did in Mein Kampf, about how the Jews were responsible for all of the problems of Germany. That is completely false. Okay, that was a false memory. And he can cite chapter and verse. He was at or near the bottom of the scale. So his memories were false memories. They weren't accurate. So when you get upscale people, their memories are true. For example, you get a guy in therapy say, oh, yeah, my father used to beat me all the time. Well, if you really look into it, you find that, well, the, the dad beat the kid twice. That's not all the time. Okay? That's a false memory. Now, in therapy, the guy might come to realize that and say, you know, now that we've discussed this, I can really, really only remember twice when my father hit me. So you see, he may have moved up a level on this scale to a higher level of truth. So that's what we're talking about here. That's why this is important. You don't want to deal with people whose memories are false. You see, people who have false memories are just as certain of their correctitude as people who have true memories. So this is sort of touched on in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's famous book, the thesis of which was, the fundamental problem with humans is stupidity, and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, if you've got somebody who's telling you the Earth is 6,000 years old, that is a false memory. It's obviously a memory because he's not reading it out of book. He's telling you, you see, so it's in his mind. But then you could say, well, what about carbon dating? Well, there are people who they don't want to hear about carbon dating. I mean, carbon dating conclusively proves that the Earth is billions of years old. We have the rocks. We've dated them. This is not hard. Okay? Anybody who wants to learn carbon dating, can learn it. And you get by the ratio of isotopes in the rock, how old this rock is. It's foolproof. So you might be able to influence the person. Maybe you can even move them up to a higher level. But clearly saying that the world is 6,000 years old is a delusional memory. It's delusional. I mean, physics has established all kinds of things as to age. 
uh, you know, we've been able to determine geological ages and planetary ages. I mean, it's, it's not a subtle point. So that's a good example of a delusional memory. Okay, so now let's look at the middle of this. We have the dividing line, which appears in many scales, the horizontal dividing line at level four. So above level four, you have sane memory, and below level four, you have insane memory. So I think you could, you could argue, correctly argue, that Hitler's memories about the Jews were insane. There are not too many people around now who don't realize that Hitler was insane. Uh, and so his, his memories were false. Of course, the further down you go, the further from sanity you get. You get progressively more insane. So as I point out throughout this book, sane and insane is not a binary choice. It's a gradation. So you have some people who are very sane and some people who are very insane. And then you have people in the middle. Now, let's look at this. Level seven says no memory. Level four says no memory. And level one says no memory. They are harmonic. So I don't want to spend too much time explaining what harmonics are, but basically it means a phenomenon that occurs on multiple levels. Um, I explain it in the book. Um, so that is why they're all no memory. But at the lowest level, no memory means denial. Well, like you have the guy who drinks a quart of scotch every day. Uh, and he de denies that he's an alcoholic. In other words, he does not have the memory in his mind that he is an alcoholic. He's in denial. See, there's no memory of it. What if you go up to level four? No memory manifests as forgotten. Well, this is normal. This is normal behavior. I can't remember where I left my keys. Oh, there they are. They're on the counter. I, you forgot. That's a distinct feeling. When you forget something, you know that you forgot it. You know, you want to mention the name. Oh, what was the name of that guy who was in Casablanca? Oh, yeah, Humphrey Bogart. See, you have the feeling that you forgot it. And then maybe later you remember it. You might not, you might not remember it. But sometimes you remember it a week later. But that's what no memory level four is. It's still no memory. It's no memory because you forgot. Wife says, did you get the, uh, the rolls from the bakery? Ah, uh, I forgot. That's normal. That's not insane, and it's not sane. It's just normal. And at level one, you have no memory needed. Now think about this. How high a state that is. If you have a person in a very high state, he doesn't need a lot of memory. Now, I realize that this is uh, hierarchies of human phenomena, but just to be illustrative of what I mean by no memory needed for a moment, angels have very little, if any, memory. What are they going to remember? Where they left their keys? They have no keys. What day of the week it is? doesn't matter to them. Uh, what's their license plate number? See, they have no car. So angels are kind of in this state of no memory needed. So you see, if you transcend the scale and you go up into the angelic realm, you're in a state of no memory needed. So this happens in, in certain humans. Uh, uh, for example, a, a famous and great uh, jazz pianist was a friend of mine went over to his house Sunday afternoon. There's a bunch of us sitting around his living room. He has his grand piano, comes out with a cigar, pardon me, with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and just played for 20 minutes. No music, didn't take any requests, didn't play anything. Oh, I recognize that, that's Mona Lisa. No, 
He just made it up as he went along for 20 minutes. It was astounding. Uh, and I've known a few musicians like that. They didn't, they didn't even remember, they didn't even need to know what song is this or anything. They could just, just play it. Uh, that's no memory needed. You see? So when a person is that advanced, he is in present space and time creating it. He doesn't need to remember it. This was actually a technique that I used. Uh, I was a remarkably successful student. I realized as a kid, the way to take a test is I didn't try to remember anything. I just answered the question. I was like, give me a question, and I would just answer the question. I was not trying to remember it. See, most kids would say, oh, what was that? Oh, yeah, I, could, I could see it was, uh, uh, it was uh, Abraham, Isaac, and David. You know, that type of thing. And they were, I just realized when I was a kid that I didn't need memory. I just knew the material. Oh, you want me to, to uh, factor this polynomial? I didn't, there was no memory going on. I just factored the polynomial and it was right. So if you really know something, you don't need memory. So you see this sometimes in somebody who's really good at something like the captain of the ship. He knows everything about that ship, okay? But if you ask him a question, very little of it is memory. He just knows what to do. They say, well, there's a gale coming up. It's 36 knots. Okay, do bop it about. He just tells him what to do. So he's not consulting his memory. That's somebody who is a highly skilled marine captain. So, as I often point out, most people have difficulty grasping the extremes of the scales because they're not real to them. They have never seen it. So, they have trouble comprehending it. But this, this scale covers the whole gamut of memory, not just memory for normal people. So if you take most of these scales and turn them on their sides and look at them demographically, it looks like a bell curve. It's not true for all of them, but this one is true, as is most of them. So everybody's got to easily understand level four. Oh, yeah, I can remember one time I, I forgot to put gas in my tank and ran out of gas. Well, see, that's no memory, forgot. But no memory denial, every time I'd say, I don't, what, what is that? How can, how can that be? What is that? What does that mean? You know, they have trouble getting it. So when a person has no need of memory, he lives in a place of truth. He knows the truth. You know, like there's a math teacher who can come in and teach the subject, never even looks in the book. He's just putting it all on the blackboard and explaining it. See, he's at truth. He knows that subject. And a person in denial, well, what is denial? Denial is saying that something that actually exists doesn't exist. What could be crazier than that? You know, there's a gorilla in the room. He says, what gorilla? There's no gorilla. He's in denial about the gorilla. So that's as false as you can get. He's saying there's no gorilla. And the gorilla is sitting there. He's living there. Okay, so now let's go into going up the scale. So no memory, when it improves, or when the person improves from that, it goes up to sporadic delusional memory. So let's talk about delusional for a moment. Delusional means it's a false memory. You're remembering it, but it didn't happen. In other words, uh, you're not denying it completely. You're saying, okay, this thing is there, but your memory of it is faulty. That is what delusion is. Now, sporadic delusional memory means 
you can only remember bits and pieces of this false statum. So this is what you get if you bring somebody up to scale. He goes from being in denial up to sporadic delusional memory. So he's still he's delusional, but he can't even remember the whole thing. So this is like the guy who tells you, um, yeah, the Martians came and abducted me last night, took me to Mars, and then brought me back today. Okay, well, tell us about it. Well, I can't remember too much about it. Oh, what, what kind of clothes did the Martians wear? I don't remember that. See, that's sporadic delusional memory. Now, if this guy were to get some therapy and improve up one level, he would go up to delusional memory, where he would be able to tell you chapter and verse. Oh, yes, the Martians wore silver jumpsuits. They had hats on that had a pee. And the guy's name was Rignad. You know? So his, his, his delusion is not sporadic. He has a complete delusional memory. This is like the guy in the nut house who tells you that he's Abraham Lincoln. There are lots of these people. Some of them think they're Napoleon. Some of them think they're Teddy Roosevelt. Okay, this is, this is a well-known phenomenon. So this guy will tell you the whole thing. Oh, yes. When I was at San Juan Hill, we charged up that hill, and I was saying, let's go, man. You know, he's got a complete delusional memory of being Teddy Roosevelt. Okay, the whole thing is false, but it's not sporadic. That's level five. So you realize this, this is very crazy, slightly less crazy, still crazy. Then if that improves, he'll just say, I forgot. He has no memory. So you might say to this guy, well, what was your sense of identity when you were in the asylum? I don't remember. See, he doesn't even remember that he used to think he was Teddy Roosevelt. He's forgotten. I, I forget. See? So he's at no memory, but he's at no memory forget, which is not sane and not insane. It's just normal. It's, you might say it's neutral. Now, if you continue to work with this guy, he'll come up to sporadic memory, meaning he will start to remember things that are actually true. Oh, yeah, I just remember that my mother used to uh, take very good care of the roses in, in the garden. I had forgotten that. See? That's sporadic memory. Well, what did she wear when she did that? I don't remember. Well, when did she start doing that? I don't remember. All I remember is that she was out there with the roses. See? It's a sporadic memory. That's what you get when you, if you're working with a person who's sane and he starts to uncover his past. Then above that is complete memory. This is what we call eidetic recall or photographic memory. This is a guy who can remember the whole thing. Like when I was in school, I had a photographic memory. It would stop me in the hall and say, uh, where can I find the reference on blah, 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 blah. And I'd say it's uh, page 22. And they'd go there and right there. So, you know, when I was taking a test, uh, I would, I would simply in my mind, open the book to the page and copy the answer out of the book from my mind. Uh, this is the type of person who could actually be suspected of cheating because his answers are perfect. Because most people do not have complete memory. And so it's not real to that that somebody could have complete memory. Uh, but there are people that, that can tell you, oh, yes, yes, when I was, when I was in Rome, I lived on this hill, and uh, I had two brothers, and their names were this and this, and, uh, and that was uh, 117 AD. There are people who can do that. So you should realize they exist. And then above that is, a, is no memory needed. Person doesn't need any memory. He just does it right. Uh, you know, there's a scene in Dune where Paul, the protagonist, shows up in a still suit. And Kynes, who's an expert on this, 
looked at him and said, have you worn a still suit before? He said, no. And so kind of said, well, how did you know how to, how to fit it? He said, I don't know, it just seemed right to me. So he, he, he somehow, he did not need memory to, to don this tire. His father, who's a normal person, had to be told, oh, this goes here and this goes, you do this like this. So that's, that's an example in literature, you know, where a person, he didn't need, so as the book goes on, you find out that he's an extraordinary being with all of these superhuman abilities. And that's really what the book is about. So that's the scale of men. Any questions? I do have a question, but just because yes. because identic memory, photographic memory, has always been fascinating to me. <clears throat> yeah, your your the way you you presented that, where you you talked about opening the book, turning to the page, and then is uh, so. I, okay, let me let me drill down on the question. Um, is that a all right, so so memory athletes. So I'm sure you've heard of these memory athletes. They have these the the memory palace in their brain, where they they have like a a place, maybe their childhood home, and and you know in this room they have this this thing, and they walk through it, and they have these really wild, vivid type things, and that helps them to recall the you know 52 decks of cards or whatever in proper order. Um, uh-huh. Is it is it part of that identic memory process? going through the the exercise sort of say to open the book to turn to the page and then finding it or is that just how it worked in that like i i I, you, I don't have an identic memory i i don't know very many people that do and so that is just really fascinating is that something that that is part of having the identic memory linked with that sort of mental exercise of opening the page turning to it and then finding it or is that just how the memory for identic memory w- works Basically, what it means is the person perceives something, and he retains the whole thing. So there are people around. You can show them a page in a phone book, a phone book he's never seen, from a place he's never been to, okay? And then close the book, and he can tell you the exact name, phone number, address of every person in that book. And it's just like he's reading it out of the book. And in a sense, he is, because he made a copy of it in his head. So in other words, complete memory is, well, I want to remember this. It's important for me to remember this. I'm going to make myself remember this. And you remember the whole thing. Bingo. And is that something that could be, that could be trained and fostered and, and, and improved? Well, again... If you are at level three, which is where most normal, smart people are, you can move yourself up to level two. Mm. Not quickly, not easily. It has to go through some kind of a transformational process, some kind of facilitation or uh, meditation or something where you elevate yourself. Uh, going back to doing, you know, there was the scene where there was this liquid, the water of life, and Paul goes in the desert and he drinks the liquid of life, and then all of his abilities are released. You know? So that was like some kind of a transformational experience where he went from being uh, just an extraordinary individual to being some messianic person which is a lot of what the book is about that it was predicted that the messiah would come and he's the messiah so there was you know changing on this is not easy you have to go through a very personal process that actually touches the person in other words you have to get to the person so it's a well-documented fact that psychopaths and sociopaths do not, pro- do not advance in therapy because the lights are on, but nobody's home. You cannot contact the BA. That's why he's like that. Narcissists, on the other hand, can make progress. It's just very slow. 
okay? Different category. Now, when you get out of those nether regions into normal people, you know, you get into uh, levels basically two, three, and four, where you know, there's a variety of things where the person can have some transformation of experience, you know, where he really gets it. Uh, and you'll see this in, uh, in musicians. You know, I, I've done a lot of teaching of music. And the student will get frustrated. He'll say, you know, I've been practicing it, but I'm not getting it. He said, it's okay. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. So week one, he can't do it. Week two, he can't do it. Week three, he can't do it. Week four, he shows up. I got it. What happened? There was a nonlinear advance. So you can't do it, you can't do it, you can't do it until you can do it. So now this is a gradual scale, this specific scale. So you'll see a person's, he's getting, he's forgetting less, he's forgetting less, he's forgetting less. Now he's up to sporadic memory. The other thing you have to realize is that this is a specific scale. So a person might be, his memory might be one way in one subject and another way in another subject. For example, I went to school, prep school, with a guy. He was in my class for four years straight. He was an absolute whiz in anything regarding math and science. So if you looked at his card, it would say like physics, 98, math, 97, English, 75. History, 81. Latin, 80. So anything in STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, he was the smartest kid in the school. Anything else, he really struggled. This guy went on to become a physicist, which was the right thing for him. So this is, this is a perfect example of a person who his memory I mean, if you asked him, you know, uh, regarding the math quiz we did last night, what was the answer on question number 16? He could just tell you, just like that. It was 22. If you ask him anything about William Butler Yeats or Shakespeare, he goes, hama, 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 like Jackie Gleason. So, perfect example of a person where this is a specific skill. His memory in STEM subjects was exquisite. And his memory in non-STEM subjects was very he struggled. And I had another friend who was the exact opposite. This guy actually got out of taking physics and got out of taking fourth year math. I don't know exactly how he did that, but somehow he got out of it. And he, he was allowed to take some other subjects, like classical literature, which he uh, was brilliant in. So you could talk to this guy about Dostoevsky and Chekhov and Shakespeare and Thomas Mann all day. But if you ask him, how do you factor a polynomial, you just get the deer in the headlight stare, you know? He could barely pass those subjects. So this is a specific scale. And you'll find this. You'll find this in somebody. I am sure if you talk to Elon Musk about Tesla or about SpaceX, his memory is spectacular. I'm sure. I never met the man. I'm just saying, I'm having listened to him speak many times, knowing a lot about him. But if you ask him about other things, I'm sure his memory is quite ordinary. You know, I mean, he's probably not going to be able to recite Shakespeare from memory. So. I don't know if I answered your question, but no, no, that's no, how yeah, this works. Yeah, I, I, again, memory is, is just such a fascinating uh, subject because, well, for a multitude of different reasons. But yeah, very, very, yes. good, very good. We'll, we'll go ahead and move yeah, to that. Yeah, and one of the things that I learned in teaching uh, and the hundreds of students that I've worked with is don't try to get him to memorize it. I'm not saying that's always a bad idea. Get him to understand it. See? If you ask me about the Pythagorean theorem, 
I do not recall it, but I know it. See, there's nothing of my going, let's see, what is that? Oh, yeah, A squared plus B squared equals C. That doesn't happen. It's like asking me, would you like a glass of water? Yes. See, there's no memory involved. So to me, the Pythagorean theorem is like, it's more real to me than my own name because the name is arbitrary. You could call me Fred and I would still be the same guy. But the Pythagorean theorem, that's, that's universal, literally universal. It's throughout this universe. There's no place in this universe where it's not true. So it's, it's so fundamental. That's the type of thing that you, when, when you get it, you have, you're, you're not remembering it. You're just, it's just part of you. And that's what you see in athletes. If you watch skilled athletes, it's not about memory because it's too fast. You know, like uh, Rocky Marciano has a, had a very specific way of boxing. He had a very specific strategy. He would look for an opening and hit the guy. Now, between spotting the opening and hitting the guy was like maybe a hundredth of a second. I've watched the videos. You cannot see his hand move. You see a blur. And then you see the other guy snoring on the, on the ground. Okay? So that's not about, he's not remembering anything. You see? It's the same thing in baseball. I used to play baseball. If you're thinking about it, you're not going to get anywhere. Yogi Berra famously said, Yogi Berra was the most valuable player in the American League three times. Yeah, and he famously said, I can't think and hit at the same time. Because he was so good, people would try to pick his brain. Well, what do you do? How do you do this? I don't know. They throw the ball and they hit it. So, because you have to realize that between the time when the pitcher lets go of the ball uh, and you get it in a professional context, it's half a second. Now, you only have half that time to figure out what is this? Is this a fastball? Is this a slider? Is this a curveball? Is this a changeup? If you don't figure that out in a, in a quarter of a second, you're not going to hit the ball. That's how pitchers defeat you. Well, I, th I, th I thought it was a fastball. It wasn't. It was a changeup. See? You look like an idiot. So you have a quarter of a second. Okay, so if you know anything about neurology, you cannot possibly remember anything in that period of time. It's just you see it and you hit it. You see it, you know it, and you hit it. It's like close to instantaneous. And any athletes you watch, that's what's going on with them. They're not remembering, oh, this is how you make a free throw. Well, in a free throw, maybe because you have some time. But as far as in the middle of a game and getting up and dunking that ball, they're not remembering. If you have to remember it, you don't belong on that team. So uh, it's obvious in athletes, but it's true in other subjects too. You talk to some chemist. Uh, you know, he he doesn't have to consult some book. So no. He 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 just he just it's it's embedded him in him. Some people would say it's in his DNA, which is a false analogy. I mean, you can say that if you want, but it goes beyond that. It's a it's a memory thing. It's like uh, no memory needed. If you're if you're in that if you're in that you know, there's a famous story about Joe Lewis, this great heavyweight champion, where there was one, one fight in his career where he didn't prepare the way he prepared for all the other fights. And while he was in training, his manager kept telling him, you know, you're not doing what you normally do. That's ah, okay. I'll skip road work today. I'm, I'm in good shape, you know? So he gets in the ring, and the guy's beating him. So now he gets in the corner, bell rings, he's in the corner, and he says to the trainer, what should I do? And the trainer says, you already did it. See? 
too late now. If you got to ask your trainer, what should I do? You're going to get beat. You already did it. He didn't train properly the way he had trained. And that was a lesson for him. He never did that again. And he, and he went back the next fight and he took the, shrink, took the crown back and then continued to train like that. So that's all sort of mixed up in this. You know, when you see people, when you see uh, Eric Clapton playing a guitar, believe me, it's not about memory. It's about expression. He never played that solo before, and he's never going to play it again. And if you ask him, what did you do? He'll say, I don't know. Let's listen to the tape. It's not unusual. Okay. All right. Yeah, very, very good. Very good. Here we go. Okay, the scale of spiritual identity. Now, there are humans who have my deepest sympathy who deny the existence of anything spiritual. They say there's no afterlife, there's no, no such thing as a spirit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those people are at one day at the bottom of this scale. Uh, most people have some sense of spirituality. Now, this is a linear scale, meaning there's no apparent congruence between levels one and seven. It's a quantum scale, meaning these levels are discrete. You're either at level two or you're at level three, period. There's nothing in between. There's no intervening gradation, and it's a general scale, meaning once you find your level on this scale, you are done. You can try to move yourself up one level, but there are no more applications of this for you. Now, you can do it to other people, and let's, you do it, let's say for your wife, you find it, you are done. Okay, that's a general scale. So what are we measuring here? What is this a scale of? This is a scale of cause to effect. When you are at one near the top of the scale, you are very positive. And when you're at one near the bottom of the scale, you are at effect. So, obviously, success is about being at cause. Right? When the boxer goes in the ring, his intention is not to get beat, usually. It's to win, right? So if he's going to be at cause, he's going to win. That was his intention, right? So the basketball player's got the ball. He's going to take a free throw. Free throw. He wants to get that ball in the basket. If he's causative, it goes in the basket. Okay? Now, a person who's at effect is having things happen to him beyond his control. He can't control them. Okay? That is what the scales measure. Now, of course... Total cause is, is an absolute, so it's above level one. And total effect is an absolute, so it's below level seven. But that is, that is what this scale is an indicator of. This tells you a lot. When you spot somebody on this scale, you know how positive that person is. So, you know, the, the, there are some people you can... Put them in a context, and they just get it. You know, uh, put a guy in a rifle range for the first time in his life. You say, there's a target. You see the bullseye? I want to hit the bullseye. This is okay. Picks up the gun. He shoots. hits the bullseye. Now, there's a guy next to him. Weeks go by. He never hits the bullseye. Okay? He's at effect. He is not causative in that area. So, do you want someone who's causative or not? So, let's say you marry a woman who's at effect. She can't take care of the kids. She can't take care of the, the house. She can't manage the checkbook. She can't manage her job. You see, she's at effect. She is going to be at or near the bottom of the scale. So, this tells you a lot about the person. This tells you, do you want this person around you or not? So let's start from the bottom and go up. Now, again, remember, most people, to the extent that they have difficulty understanding this, will have most difficulty understanding the extremes because it's not real to them. This is not something they've seen, not something they've heard about, not something they understand. So level seven is the person whose spiritual identity 
is as an inanimate object. His identity is that he is a thing. Now, you ever hear the term devic entities? Comes from Hinduism. There are beings who think they're rocks, think they are grains of sand, think they are electrons, uh, think they are the sky. There's no limit to this. There are beings around whose spiritual identity is a thing. Not an animate thing, an inanimate thing. That is, is, that is the lowest spiritual identity you can have. A being who thinks he's a thing. And many people can see this and can communicate with these people. Uh, if, you, if you are capable of telepathy, you could see that there is a being here who thinks he's let's say, a cup or a fork. Well, that's, a, that's really being at effect, isn't it? What's he going to do if he's a fork? Right? People are going to pick him up, use him, put him in the dishwasher. He has no control over anything. You see how this works? So a being who's really at effect, because of that, at the bottom of the scale, his identity is that he's an inanimate object. Up from that is an animate object, which is what we mean by an animal. Now, you might say, well, what about plants? Well, I'm including plants in this. So, obviously, in biology, there's a distinction between plants and animals, but they're living things. They respond. Uh, you know, there are people who've actually done experiments with plants, uh, hooking them up to uh, biofeedback meters, and the plant's uh, electromagnetic field will change according to what you say to it, according to what kind of music you play. You know, you put on WC, and the plant has a certain reaction. You put on heavy metal. The plant has has a, a, a completely different reaction to that, so this is not an unknown thing. So whether you're a plant or an animal, plants can perceive plants and animals can perceive things, and there's enormous numbers of people who think they are animate objects. So this is the type of person who says we're just animals. I think it was. Uh, Plato, if I remember correctly, who said, people are animals who can talk. So this is a, a level that's populated by many humans. Now, when you get into level seven, that's more like ding, ding, here comes the wagon with the guys with the white coats. No. This is like you find some guy in an insane asylum in a catatonic state, well, he thinks he's an object. You see, that person is at effect. He can't be at cause over it. That's why he's in the insane asylum, because he can't, in order to live, you have to be at cause. You have to be able to fix your food, put your clothes on, drive your car, say hello to the neighbor, you know? So you see how that works. You would find People at level seven or what we would call insane. Now, animate object, there's millions and millions of people who think they're animate objects. They deny the existence of any kind of spirituality. No, I'm not a spirit. I'm just, I'm just an animal, just like this dog. Or just, I'm a living thing, just like that tree. That's their identity. So they are not as at effect as level seven. Up from that is a persona. Now, this is where most people are. The guy has an identity. In other words, Joe Smith. Who are you? I'm Joe Smith. So this could also be something like, I'm the president. I'm the king. I'm a humble servant. Whatever it is. He has some kind of a persona. 
And that's how he identifies himself. So he is, this is it's probably billions of people at this level. Of They think of themselves as a persona. See, the guy doesn't really think of himself as a meat body, which is what a person at level six thinks. He has a little bit more uh, causativeness, so he thinks of himself as some kind of a persona or identity. I'm an Irishman, you know, something like that. Up from that is a spirit. Now, this is this is religious people or even spiritual people who don't belong to religion who say, yes, I'm a spiritual being. Now, I used to hit the word ghost here as a synonym. Uh, we don't want to get into Casper the ghost and scary movies and stuff like that, but that's the general idea. It's a spiritual being that exists separate from a body. So I suspect the majority of people on Earth are at this level. They realize that they are a spirit. And it doesn't matter what religion they're in or no religion at all, you know, they still say, yes, I'm a spirit. Uh, and there's all kinds of studies and statistics that show this, from which you can infer this. Uh, vast majority of people believe there's some kind of an afterlife, believe that there are spirits. And anybody who believes that there are spirits believes that he's a spirit. He's not going to say, well, there are, there are spirits and I'm not one of them. That doesn't happen. So this person is fairly, fairly causative. He's causative enough to realize that he's a spiritual being. So this is what you see uh, throughout history, uh, where, uh, you know, this is where bigotry comes in. See, people who identify you as a body are saying that you are not a spiritual being. See, for example, there are no black spirits or white spirits or Caucasian spirits or Asian spirits. They're just spirits. So you see, when you get to this level, there is no bigotry. You look at a white guy and you look at a black guy and you say, well, they're both spiritual beings. So you see, to that person, racism doesn't exist because he says this guy is a spiritual being. And after the body dies, he's still that spirit. So when you see people like Hitler, for example, saying, oh, we got to get rid of the Jews. Well, that was a kind of a racist attitude. They are a race, and we're going to get rid of them. So he clearly did not have the idea that they were spiritual beings, just as the Germans are spiritual beings. If he had had that level of causativeness, he wouldn't have gone around killing them. So when a person gets to this level where he realizes the spirit, a lot of the ills of mankind fall away. So you have the Christians in the Colosseum uh, who could have saved themselves by relenting, by saying, no, I give up Christianity. I believe in the Roman gods. And the Romans would have said, okay, get out of here. The people in the Colosseum, the people said, no, I'm a spiritual being. I'm following Jesus, and I will be in heaven after you kill me. So they let the lions out, the lions rip them to shreds, and they go to heaven. So those people understood that they were spiritual beings. That is why they took that tap. And uh, you have to realize that. A person who says he has a soul is at level five. A person who says, I am a soul, is at level four. It's his identity. So you have vast numbers of people who think they're a persona. They think, yeah, I'm Fred Johnson. You know, that's how he thinks of himself. And he has a soul, and his soul will go to heaven. He's at level five. Level five. Whereas you have another guy who says, no, I'm a spiritual being. doesn't matter what my name is. doesn't matter what my skin color is. You see, I'm 
uh, separate from this body. I'm with this body now, but it's going to die, and it's okay because I'll still be around. Up from that, the next level up is an angel. So an angel is a free being. Uh, of course, an angel realizes he's a spirit, but he's a free spirit. So all of the psychological and emotional burdens that people have are either non-existent or minimal in an angel. He's a free being. So he's a spirit, and he goes around doing things as a spirit. He has no interest in, in assuming a corporeal form. Up from that is a god. Well, you see this in the Greco-Roman and the Norse gods, various gods, Venus and Mercury and, and Thor, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a divine being. So that's a being who is beyond an angel. Uh, so this has some spectacular powers. Now, if you study the Greco-Roman mythology, as they call it, you know, you have Poseidon, or you know, the name for him is Neptune, it's the same god, was in the sea, you know, the god of the sea. So that's sort of like his domain. So domain. So he's he has these vast powers, he's beyond an angel. But he's still not totally at cause. He still has limitations. And then at the top, you have infinity, which is what we mean when we talk about God. Okay, so your spiritual identity is that you are infinity. Now, many people have gotten to this level and then sort of deteriorated back down. That is the norm. It's very hard for a human to get high on this scale and stay there. It's much easier for a person to uh, pursue some spiritual practice such as meditation and get to one of these higher states and then sort of lose it. He sort of, because when you get back down to things like eating and sleeping and you got a mosquito bike and bite and you stubbed your toe and, you know, it's kind of hard to think of yourself at these higher levels. So that's what this scale is about. Very, <clears throat> very good, very good. And, you know, I think that, Brings us to a good place to to stop for today, Jim. Again, okay. I just I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much for for one, uh, taking the time to to go through this information with us, but also just to f thank you for writing such a such a profound work and and, and then again sharing that with uh, individuals. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Your success is my reward. Very good. Well, listeners, I, I thank you for, for joining us on this journey. Tune in next time as we dive into further scales in Septemics. Thanks, Chris.